Hey everyone, me Kevin here. Let's talk about Airbnb, which is expected to go public December 10th, probably around 11 a.m. Eastern time. That's usually when we see these guys hit the market. And in this video, I'm not gonna tell you what the heck Airbnb is. Instead, I'm gonna tell you some really important facts that you gotta know if you're considering investing in this company. Then I'm gonna talk about a danger that you gotta be aware of. You gotta know this danger. Then we'll do some analysis on this. And by doing analysis, I basically mean I'm just gonna show you the analysis that I did. And then I'm gonna give you my opinion as some random dude on YouTube in terms of what I'm going to do. So don't sue me, bro, if all of this is wrong and you end up losing money because you sold the stock when it fell after the IPO. But will it fall? <laughs> Let's find out. Quick reminder, if you wanna join me in my private stock investing live streams where we talk stocks and real estate, check out the coupon code down below to get into any of the programs on stocks, real estate investing, making money from home, making YouTube videos. You could even email me to bundle up by sending me an email to kevin at meetkevin.com asking for a bundle. All right, let's keep this simple and get right into Airbnb. So Airbnb kicked butt before COVID. Gross revenue went from $2.5 billion in 17 to 3.6 in 18 and 4.8 and 19. That means from the end of 2017 to the end of 2019, that's just 24 months, the market revenue almost doubled at Airbnb. That's insane. Now, COVID obviously threw a wrench in this. After all, Airbnb has to do with traveling and there were insane cancellations. Airbnb had more cancellations than bookings in March and April when this pandemic started raging. Over the last 12 months, Airbnb still though managed to bring in $3.6 billion of revenue, which isn't as high as what they had in 2019, but it matches their 2018 revenue despite being in the midst of a pandemic. Most investors are looking at this as a result as a classic recovery stock, but there's a unique twist to this recovery stock. See, this recovery stock doesn't have the insane expenses or debts that the other recovery stocks have. Think about this. When you buy Delta Airlines, you are getting a slice of a company with 80,000 employees and you are buying a slice of 765 planes that have to be maintained. Yeah, you gotta buy new planes too at some point. And when you buy Carnival Cruise Lines, you are buying a slice of 87 ships that are rotting in the ocean right now with 120,000 employees. When you look at Airbnb, you're pretty much buying an app, some designers for an app, and a customer service team. Now look, Airbnb isn't a small company. I suppose the way I just described that makes you think it's just a group of people in a, in a garage somewhere. No, they've got, well, they had about 7,500 employees, but they cut their staff by 1,900 team members, about 25% because of the pandemic. This means they're actually a pretty lean company with only about 5,400 employees right now. And on top of having a substantially smaller employee group and you don't have airplanes and cruise ships to have to worry about as something you're buying, you're also, when you buy Airbnb, you're not buying any commercial real estate, which ordinarily you might think, oh, it'd be nice to have like hotels and, and buildings in, in sort of a stock. Those are good assets, right? Not commercial real estate. By all accounts, commercial real estate has probably shaved about 30% of its total value off, gone, because of the pandemic. Hotels are suffering. On the flip side, residential real estate values have been skyrocketing, and people have been eating up buying more real estate. And as values go up, more people are actually interested in potentially using Airbnb to offset their monthly payments on now more expensive properties because the residential sector is booming. So with Airbnb, you're getting a recovery play. You're not getting hotels and cruise lines and as many employees, and you're actually playing in a sector of the industry that is doing really well, residential real estate. Real estate didn't even see the drop that stocks saw during the March and April panic season. And in addition to that, if we check out page 409 of Airbnb's S1, take a look at this. They have about $3 billion, probably closer to about $3.3 billion here in cash and current assets, things that could be cash within a year if they needed it. If we go down to liabilities, they have about $3.7 billion in current liabilities. And almost all of their liabilities are current because again, they don't have like massive mortgages on commercial buildings that just lost a ton of value. So they could almost take the $3.3 billion in cash they have and eradicate 
the $3.7 billion in liabilities they have. Much of that, the bulk of it here, that $2.3 billion, are payments that just need to be made to their customers, to their vendors. So, so this is just short-term money that's payable and needs to be distributed. So really, if Airbnb wanted to, they could almost pay off all of their debt. Oh, but wait, they have this cool thing coming up called an IPO which the IPO is going to raise probably about $3.1 billion for Airbnb. So you're realistically going to have $3.1 billion of cash, plus the about 3.3 that you have now, about $6.4 billion. They could literally eat up all of their debt and still be rolling with a couple bills in the bank. <laughs> and that's billion, not like dollar bills. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Uh, so this is awesome, right? I mean, this makes us look at this as a recovery stock and it's like, but is it a recovery stock? I mean, it's in the travel sector, but this is really like a software company that has very little chance of going belly up. I mean, the odds of this filing bankruptcy relative to like a Marriott or uh, Delta Airlines, really, really low here, right? So instead, we're gonna look at this company and focus on growth. And this is where things get entertaining. See, 59% of Airbnb customers are between 25 and 44 year olds, years old. If I include 18 to 24 year olds, 74% of Airbnb's customers are under 44. This means you really have a ton of millennials and entrepreneurs and younger people using this service. You don't actually even have the people yet with a higher net worth who are generally older. You don't yet have the people who are retired who are also generally older than 44 and who have more time to travel. And so this is where Airbnb has something really interesting about it. And it has also to do with this demographic that we haven't quite hit yet at Airbnb. See, when an Airbnb host signs up for Airbnb, there's something known as the positive feedback loop that happens. When a host signs up for Airbnb, guests looking on the Airbnb website realize they have more choices. People like choices. When more guests come to the Airbnb website and use Airbnb, average rental prices go up until all of a sudden you get more hosts coming onto the platform, which then drives prices back down again, which leads more customers to come onto the platform, which again leads more hosts to come onto the platform. To always keep this equilibrium price of a stay down to somewhere on an average of $121 per night. And quick note, this $121 per night is for stays and experiences, it gets lowered by experiences. If we only look at stays, the average sort of price of an Airbnb unit per night is upwards of 160 to $170 per night. But you continuously grow the service at the same time. That's the positive feedback loop of Airbnb. More users equals more listings and more listings equals more users. And as this loop continues to sort of teeter totter up, you also tend through attrition to get the older generations who are retiring or who have retired and are more capable of spending money on traveling more. This is a huge potential market. And they're only just now trying to convince these older demographics to get into Airbnb to actually help these newer Airbnb users fall in love with Airbnb, Airbnb launched something called Airbnb Plus Homes. According to AirDNA, the Airbnb Plus sector only represents 0.6% of existing hosts. And as this expands, Airbnb might be able to utilize these plus listings to convince more people to try Airbnb because a lot, at least from research that I'm finding, a lot of the people who are cons who know about Airbnb but haven't used it, who might be the older demographics, are afraid of not having a consistent customer service experience. Airbnb is trying to solve this with Airbnb Plus. You, in order to actually have an Airbnb Plus listing, by the way, you have to have a minimum of a 4.8 star rating and a 95% acceptance rate on bookings. And this increases the quality being offered to potentially newer customers, which if you have a good experience, your first time using an Airbnb, guess what usually happens? You come back, you're like, whoa, this is great. And as millennials gain wealth and have children, they'll be more likely to travel more. So really just looking at our demographics, alone, you have this natural growth potential for Airbnb to continue to grab and grab market share. And see, of course, Airbnb competes with hotels, but are hotels actually a risk for Airbnb? Sure, but one of the things that I notice is websites like iProperty Management, which has done analysis on Airbnb, says that 86% of people actually prefer the convenient locations that Airbnb offers, which sometimes hotels just can't. 
And 77% of people who are using Airbnb report that they like the fact that when they use Airbnb, they can live like they're a local. They don't live like they're a tourist. Now, Marriott is trying to compete with this, but so far Marriott's offerings for you know, rental houses have been limited to higher end, more exclusive homes, and there are very few choices. And this kind of goes back to that feedback loop problem. In order for you to actually have a positive feedback loop, you gotta have offerings for people to use the listings and then more people to use them. But if you go to Marriott and you try to book a home experience in the same fashion as you would an Airbnb, you wouldn't have a lot of choices. That means people end up rubber banding right back to Airbnb and potentially never leaving the Airbnb service. Look, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not all up for Airbnb. Airbnb does have risks as well, especially regulation risks. But the cool thing about this is a lot of cities, and I encourage you to just look at your Airbnb rules in your city, just Google it, short-term vacation rental rules, and then put your city name in there and see what the rules are if you wanted to become a host. The cool thing about doing this is you'll see that a lot of cities, while there are some that have just outright banned vacation rentals, well, there are a lot of cities that say, hey, you know what? <laughs> Let's just throw a tax on, you know, a hotel and occupancy tax on these Airbnb listings and make some money, legalize and tax it rather than ban them. For example, in the city that I'm in, I can run Airbnbs anywhere that I want. I can't run them in like accessory dwelling units, which are smaller units, but out of any house in my city, I can run an Airbnb and basically I just pay a 10% tax to the city and the city's happy about it which is kind of cool. You get a lot of this flexibility. Before Airbnb had started becoming more legal or these short-term rentals had become uh, started becoming more legal, you had a big risk factor with Airbnb that, what if my city bans Airbnb? You know, what, what if this isn't gonna happen? Right now though, the trend is in favor of legalizing and taxing rather than banning. In fact, I mean, just consider this. In Paris in 2014, Airbnb was banned. And in 2015, they cracked down on short-term rentals, fining people up to $25,000. Then in 2017, they said, you know what, on second thought, how about you just register? And when you hear register, that just means AKA get taxed. Then we'll let you have Airbnb. So you want an Airbnb? In Paris, pay the tax, you get yourself an Airbnb. What about Barcelona, Spain? Well, if Barcelona, Spain originally said that's it. Every single Airbnb is getting delisted unless you pay us a tax and then, well, you can stay. Germany, for example, has also blamed that Airbnb increases rent and causes housing shortages. And in 2014, banned short-term rentals that have not ex received explicit permission from the Berlin Senate, which that's like, okay, yeah, that's not gonna happen. This is for Berlin Airbnbs, right? <laughs> However, in March of 2018, the city overturned that law and now people can rent out their primary homes without time restrictions as long as they get a permit and pay the taxes. Same thing happened in Amsterdam and in London. You can rent out a place as an Airbnb for up to 140 days per year. Santa Monica and San Francisco, they're probably the toughest, but they're kind of the more rare ones here. Santa Monica, for example, requires that you live on the property and pay a 14% occupancy tax to be able to rent out part of it on a short-term rental basis. And in San Francisco, well, Airbnbs are allowed also if you're a full-time resident of the actual property itself, but you can only do a short-term rental for 90 days within the city. Otherwise you get fined like $484 per day for a first time offense. And then that doubles if you're a repeat offender, AKA no profit to be made in San Francisco. But the point is, sure, you've got a couple of these holdouts like San Francisco and Santa Monica that are like, nope, no Airbnb here. But across much of the world and many cities throughout the country, uh, in America, most municipalities are realizing, why are we saying no to this? Just tax it and let it happen. So this is all good. I mean, overall, this sounds really exciting. Okay, but what's the danger then? Well, like, why should we not invest in Airbnb? Well, I always like to get some dangers out of the way, especially when we're talking about a lot of exciting things about this new listing coming up and everybody wanting to get into the Airbnb, of course. Well, folks, here is the danger. On page 23 of their S1, publicly filed prospectus here, uh, we, we wanna keep this in mind. So if you are going to invest in Airbnb, I, I want you to specifically know that Airbnb told you so. So when this happens at the end of, uh, you know, or at the beginning of next year when they report their earnings or, you know, somewhere around April when they report their quarter one earnings of next year, uh, you, you want to know that Airbnb told you so. And here's what Airbnb told you. 
During the fourth quarter of 2020, another wave of COVID-19 infections emerged. As a result, countries imposed a strict lockdowns. Remember, we just talked about Germany and France. A lot of these areas shut down. You know, Airbnb isn't just an American company. Sometimes we forget that. It's like we do have international customers as well, and Europe is uh, much more prone to lockdown than, than we are. And certainly less Americans are traveling to Europe, which are usually a big, uh, you know, source of travelers to, well, Europe <laughs> and European Airbnbs, therefore. But anyway, they are telling you here that similar to the impact of the initial COVID-19 wave in, 20, in March of 2020, we are seeing a decrease in bookings in most affected regions. Folks, Folks, like everywhere is a freaking infected region right now, okay? So, so this is this is a problem. As a result, we expect significantly greater year-over-year -year decline in nights and experiences booked and gross booking value in the fourth quarter of 2020 than in the third quarter of 2020 and greater year-over-year -year increases in cancellations and alterations in the fourth quarter than in the third quarter of 2020, aka... Airbnb is freaking brilliant. You want to know why they're brilliant? <laughs> they are brilliant because guess what just ended? What just ended is quarter three of 2020, which ended September uh, 30th, right? Well, they're telling you right here in this disclosure that here Q4 is basically going to be sad. Like even not just relative to the end of 2019, but even relative to the last quarter here, it's going to be bad. Like the numbers are going to come in poopy doopy. And we kind of expect those numbers to come in bad for quarter one as well, because not everybody's going to have a vaccine yet, right? So here, I'll hide myself for a second here. Quarter number one is also going to be sad. Maybe hopefully not as sad. You know, we'll put a little crying thing here. There we go. Maybe not as sad as quarter four, but it's, it's, it's also going to be pretty bad. We're still going to have the COVID. But the thing is, quarter four data won't actually be reported until like January. And what's Airbnb doing that's brilliant? Airbnb is going, hey, let's just IPO right after our quarter three earnings, which were great because COVID was like over and then, oh crap, the surge came. The surge is happening basically over here in Q4. So this is where you've got surge in the yellow over here. In the green, things were getting a lot better. Things might be even worse over here in quarter one, <laughs> right? And so they're like, let's just do our IPO right here with that data. <laughs> Basically, that's the last financial snapshot we will give investors right there. <laughs> so keep that in mind. You are buying at potentially the best recent numbers Airbnb Airbnb could ever give you. Like this is this is such a brilliant institutional move that's like well, if we want to get the most bang for our buck, let's have a bunch of people who think they know how to analyze stocks take quarter three numbers, because those were from a pandemic, and extrapolate those numbers and think that Airbnb is worth a whole lot more than it really is. <laughs> Careful, careful. So, so that's the that's a big danger, obviously, coming up, right? We know that the next two earnings reports, potentially the next three earnings reports, are going to be poopy. Uh, and this is on top of the fact that the fourth quarter is already a seasonably slow quarter. So you could potentially see the worst earnings data ever come out from the quarter four report here. And they told you so. <laughs> but nobody reads that whole thing, so they're gonna be like, mm. <laughs> so anyway, this means after the, Airb uh, the, uh, the Airbnb IPO, it's quite possible after the next few earnings reports, we're gonna see some real uh, ups and downs here in, in the stock. So we might expect some weakness. But let's put aside that weakness for a moment. Let's try to put together some post COVID. Uh, examples or expectations here for this stock. So let's go ahead and pull up some analysis and think, okay, what do we think? Post-COVID, how much could this possibly be worth as a result of what we think of the projections post-COVID? And how much is the stock going to go up to on IPO day? Let's talk about that. Okay, here we go. Let's look at the actual projections. So, so this is my stuff, which means I basically pulled it out of my butt and it could be totally wrong. So if you lose money and Airbnb goes bankrupt, uh, don't complain to me. So uh, let's look at this uh, random assortment of numbers here that I put together. If, if, if 
Airbnb's top line revenue grows 30% over the next four years. That is, we end with a crappy 2024, that's okay, not even including that, but we have a slow start to 2021, you know, quarter one, quarter two, uh, but then we, we do better. And on average, we grow 21, 22, 23, and 24 at 30% per year in top line revenue for Airbnb, which realistically for Airbnb should be entirely possible. I mean, remember, you've got that tiny, tiny senior population that's got to wake up and start using Airbnb. We're expecting after this pandemic, a ton of people to start using Airbnb more uh, than they ever have before to get back to traveling and get back to some normalcy here in life. But anyway, 30% growth should not be unreasonable to expect from Airbnb. We're not here trying to say Airbnb is going to double every year. Just 30%. You mean an average 30%. Airbnb usually has about 25% they set aside for costs. So you take 25% off of that for costs. Now, this is a spot where Airbnb is a little, a little spendy, okay? And this is going to be an issue. Over the last, uh, well, quite a few years here, I think uh, 2019, 18, 17, and 16, Airbnb has spent around 60 on the low. That was on the low when they got lucky. But generally around 65 to 70% in general administration and marketing. So GNA and marketing, they spend a ton of money combined. Usually, again, the low they've had in the past like four years has been 60%. They're usually around 65 to 70% in spending in this spot. And this is one of the reasons they've been unprofitable. But as the company starts saturating more areas and they have to spend less money expanding to new areas and instead new hosts start naturally coming to the platform, this number should go down. How much this number goes down is a game changer. So you have to be very, very careful here. You will see that in my analysis, I have the combination of expenses here for 2024 at 55%. So it's not like I'm saying they're going to get this down to 40% or 30%. Uh-uh. It's still going to be high. As that changes over time, and this is why you can't just blindly buy a stock and then leave it. You've got to keep revisiting these companies. If this number improves even beyond this projection, that's going to be really, really good for the stock price. So pay attention to that. Uh, this is kind of like looking at margin at Tesla, okay? You got to see how these companies are spending their money. They can make money like crazy, but if they just suck at advertising and actually growing their business, then that's not good. Remember, they've got like 5,400 employees and they, they got to be working like a well-oiled machine. Now, there are some people that say, hey, Airbnb just laid off 25% of the people, you know? I mean, does that mean are, are maybe the better salespeople left over? I don't know. To me, I hear that and I'm like, that sounds wrong. That's brutal. Like people lost their jobs and livelihoods here. But you know, Wall Street is basically if Wall Street were a human, it'd be a dick. Okay. So going back to the projection and if we include 20% as a, an effective tax rate, assuming Biden's going to raise rates to 28%, but then their effective tax rate will be lower. We could potentially see, uh, you know, in this sort of base case scenario, and in my opinion, we could potentially see a net income for Airbnb of somewhere around uh, $1.5 billion. Now, some analysts, think that's too high. Some analysts think uh, instead of being close to around 15% as a net net after everything here, some people think that Airbnb is going to be closer to 9%. So, uh, you know, this is my opinion. I think they're going to be able to reduce some of their marketing spend and stop spending on these really expensive SEO ads. And I think uh, as Airbnb becomes more mainstream, even more so than it already is, because it already is the dominant force. But as they continue to rob market share, which I think they will from Expedia and bookings.com, uh, uh, you know, I think Airbnb's got really good potential here. So this is my base case scenario, is that they will have a net income of $1.5 billion. Divided by the shares outstanding would give us an annual earnings per share of about 2.62 times an earnings rate of uh, 50 times or an earnings multiple of 50. This share price of Airbnb could potentially be worth uh, somewhere around $130 in 2024. Now, what I did here is I wrote down some other P.E. ratios that exist right now. You've got Expedia with a forward P.E. of 112. Marriott's with a forward P.E. of 40. Booking has a P.E. of 63. Uh, so I'm probably going a little bit on the average up here for a P.E. ratio at 50 for Airbnb. But I'm kind of, with the exception of Expedia here, I mean, this is just ridiculous, but that's because their, their sales have been so low. Uh, but uh, my opinion is a 50 P.E. ratio is not unreasonable for Airbnb because it's almost like a SaaS it doesn't have all of the plant property and equipment of like a Delta or a Carnival or a Marriott. Uh, so in my opinion, that premium of selling for about 50 times earnings justified here. You know, Apple's like 40 times earnings. And even in four years, I think Airbnb is going to be much more of a fledgling company than Airbnb or, uh, than Apple. 
So uh, it, it would be would not be unreasonable to see it even go higher than 50. 50 might even be a little bit on the conservative side for Airbnb. Uh, but anyway, that means if you at IPO bought shares at $100, and if this projection was accurate, and the future share price ended up going to about 130, then you'd only be making about 7% per year uh, on, on your investment. So uh, that's at buying it at $100 on IPO day. And this is kind of the more base case what I'm expecting for Airbnb. Uh, definitely not a definitely not a two banger there, right? Uh, depending on what you buy it for. You know, if you buy it for 60, well, then it's a two banger. It's doubled, right? Now, just a quick warning. Look, the market is looking for opportunity anywhere. So this is really important. Even though we're going through these, these projections here, you've got to keep in mind that I'm multiplying earnings per share by 50. It's entirely possible that the market's going to say, screw you, Kevin, we are going to multiply Airbnb's value by 100 to 200. We don't care about your 50 times earning. This is Airbnb. And we don't care if it loses money for the next eight years. We're going to keep buying it, even at 100 times earnings or 200 times earnings. So do keep that in mind. That is entirely possible with how frothy the stock market is right now. In which case, when you look at these projections, instead of multiplying by 50, multiply by 100 to 200. Because, yeah, that could happen. I'm not buying uh, at, at those levels, you know, may, maybe tiny little, tiny little bits if we're closer to, to reasonableness. But uh, yeah, keep that in mind when you're looking at these numbers. That is what the market could do. Let's now jump on over to the bullish scenario. The one thing that I changed over at the bullish scenario, you could see I kept this at 55% for the expenses, but I said that they might grow at 40% per year. That might be a little, um, that might be pushing it a little bit, okay? This is the bullish scenario. This is like, I'm going all in Airbnb. I believe in this hardcore. In this case, you using the same spreadsheet here, you might be able to see Airbnb start knocking on the door of $200 per share in 2024. Same 50 times earning multiple here. Uh, you know, I, this is a little, this is a little lofty in my opinion. It puts it at a market cap of over $100 billion. Uh, you know, that might be pushing it just a little bit. We'll see. That would give you a nice return though, about 15%. Uh, if you got it for $100, you'd almost be uh, doubling your money in those four years. You'd be doubling your money in, in the fifth year. Uh, so, okay, all right, I mean, that's the bullish scenario. Now, the bearish scenario, all right, bearish scenario, this takes the approach that Airbnb can't get their costs below 60% uh, for, for G&A and marketing, and their growth doesn't grow as much as we'd hoped. This is a growth company, and when you don't have growth, the share price goes meh. <laughs> so let's say they only grow 20% on average per year, 2021, two, uh, three, and four for the next four years. And then they might have revenue of somewhere around seven and a half bill. And uh, their expenses being at 60%, they might only take around uh, $822 million to the bottom line at the end of 2024. This would mean that they'd have an earnings per share of about $1.36 times a 50 multiple. The share price of this company in the future could potentially be as low as 68 bucks. This is the bear case scenario. This is like Airbnb's floundering here, okay? That means if you buy it for 100 at, at, on Airbnb IPO day and we go bear case scenario, growth is slow, they can't get their expenses down and this thing limps along, you're gonna be upside down after Airbnb uh, uh, IPO day. And that's not gonna be so good. Nobody wants to be upside down. Nobody wants to lose money. So what do you have to know? Like, how do you how do you actually reconcile this, all of this? And, and what do we actually think is going to happen? What do I think is going to happen? What am I gonna do? Well, I'm not gonna go super bull and I'm not gonna go super bear here. My expectation is we'll probably have some of that scenario in between where a reasonable valuation for Airbnb in 2024 with 30% growth and shaving a little bit of their marketing expenses. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if this is 100, you know, 50, 130 to $150 stock in, in a few years. The problem is uh, IPO day is going to be insane. And it seems like every time I do valuations that are a few years out, the stock ends up running up before that. No guarantees that that's going to happen, but it would not shock me if we see an incredible surge in the IPO pricing or share pricing uh, on IPO day. Now we do know that employees, existing employees or existing shareholders of Airbnb are allowed to sell up to 15% of their shares on day one. This is really unique. Usually you have share lockup agreements that prevent existing shareholders from dumping their shares on IPO day. For example, Snowflake, their first lockup expiration is December 16th. 
Uh, and restricted shares will then be unrestricted. And in theory, those people could sell their shares if they wanted to. That stock is up 60% since IPO day. You know, you were able to get it for like 240, 250 on IPO day on September 14th. Not even what they priced it at. They priced that IPO way lower, like down in the 120, 130 range. I can't remember exactly. Uh, but the point is what you were actually able to buy it for was like 240 and now it's like 390. So Snow did very well. Snowflake has done great so far. First lockup happens on December 16th, though. That restricted shares uh, availability potentially led to more of an explosive growth here. But anyway, that's Snowflake. So what about me? Well, here's me, okay? If I can get shares at $100 a share, I don't know if I'm jumping up and down for it because in my you know baseline scenario, that's gonna make me like 7% on my money. It wouldn't shock me for the market to try to price that in. My baseline scenario is probably gonna get priced in on IPO day. Now, if I get shares for 100 bucks a share, or, you know, honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if this just jumps up to $110 a share or potentially even more. We'll see. We'll see. Quarter four and quarter one is going to be hard. If it jumps up past 100, 110 bucks, honestly, I might just wait for quarter four to, or, or quarter one to add this. Uh, let some of the IPO hype go away. Because remember, every trader and their mother is going to be trying to get into this stock on IPO day. It's going to be a frenzy. It's going to be madness. Let all the traders get out. Let, let the euphoria die down let people go oh crap man those earnings sucked and, and maybe the market is expecting that so who knows i mean anything can happen but look if this thing runs up past 100 bucks it, it makes me get a little nervous just because I'm, I'm really baking in a small return in my baseline scenario and that's not good hey everyone quick update on what you should expect for the airbnb ipo look at doordash on screen here it had its first trade at 182 dollars well, it was priced for close to $100. I think it was $102 to $105 is what it was priced for. And it just shot up uh, to its first trade at 182 It's actually there right now. It ran as high as about 190 195 So you can see it's trading right around that 180 range there. Very volatile. Uh, if we translate this to Airbnb, that works out to about a 78% bump. So if Airbnb prices their shares at, let's say, 65 they might change this again. So let's go with 65 times 1.78, we would expect Airbnb to trade around 115. Yep, that was my expectation. So I, when I first recorded this video, I thought, you know, look, I'll get it if I can get it between 100 to 105. My guess is it wouldn't be a shocker if it starts trading over 120 because the market is so desperate to buy stuff right now. There's so much cash in the market that uh, honestly, fundamental valuation is passe. It's sad. Now I could go bull, you know, if, if we look at that bull scenario and we go, well, my bullish scenario says it's a, it's almost a $200 stock, you know, 180, 178 here to $200 stock with just a 50 times earning multiple in 2024. That's a nice 15% return per year. Again, with just a 50 times earnings multiple. If they value this thing in four years at hundred times earnings, phew, that's like a 30% return per year. That's when you make money. You make money on Airbnb if they smash the growth rate. That's where you're going to make money on this. So if you're like gung-ho about uh, about Airbnb, I could see you potentially paying 120 bucks a share to, to get into Airbnb and it being okay if you really expect Airbnb's growth to be explosive. Uh, I don't I don't know. I don't have that 100% confidence yet that we're going to see this insane explosiveness of growth. Uh, and, and so for me, 100 is probably my limit. You know, can I be convinced that 105? I don't know. Maybe it's it's getting a little small return. I'm really going to have to start seeing the market just really consistently value Airbnb higher than I expect they will. Uh, I would have to see their revenue growth be higher. And I'd rather buy them on some of the dips that might come up in the future. But they might not. You know, Snowflake fell like 20 bucks uh, on, on after IPO day. That's it. And then and just recently, you know, it shot up over $130. So sometimes you're just better to be in and see what happens if you really believe the, uh, in the company. Uh, and of course, if you're a bear uh, and and you don't think Airbnb is going to do well, then, then certainly you shouldn't even be bothering looking at this stock because it'll probably sell for over, you know, 80, 90, $100 per share pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, it's not going to be worth that in the future if, if you're a bear and they don't end up growing and you think that that's what uh, is going to transpire. So bottom line out of all of it for me, would I buy this at $100? Maybe just for fun, I'll throw a nibble in. I'll throw a little bit of an order in at a, at a limit of $100 per share. If I get some shares of Airbnb, great. Is it going to make sense for me to go crazy for this over, you know, much over $100? Not really. Uh, even at $100, I'm kind of like, I don't know. I'd almost rather just be a Tesla over $100. Uh, however, 
if after these next two earnings reports, we get some weakness and there's some new opportunities to buy this closer to $80, $90, that might look pretty good. Uh, and if you personally think, hey, Kevin, they're going to smash those growth numbers, well, you might have the capacity to pay more for this stock. That's my POV. I like it. I'll put my order in. I'll put my hat in the ring, so to speak. Am I expecting this thing to go nuts on IPO day? Heck yeah. Would it surprise me for on December 10th, them to come out and say, hey, we're going to raise the target to $70 and then it opens up at $95 or $105. No, would not surprise me whatsoever. I think everybody knows Airbnb. It's almost like a household name at this point. Even if they don't use Airbnb, they're like, oh yeah, I get into Airbnb. Uh, and, and that creates a, a serious risk for overvaluation. So you got to be careful on the IPO days. You could really pay a lot on an IPO day, but hey, look at Snowflake. Anybody who bought IPO day, they're doing pretty well right now. So good for them. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. If you like my perspective, consider checking out my amazing programs on real estate investing, stock investing, making YouTube videos. You can see all of that via the links down below. And folks, we'll see you next time.